In this video, let's learn about semaphore. Semaphore is another thread synchronization technique. However, it's less often used for protect critical sections. We have learned locks, monitors, mutexes, reader and writer lock. Those are all used to protect a critical section in order to avoid risk conditions and inconsistent behaviors. Semaphore, although can be used to do the same thing, and more often used for controlling the number of concurrent threads or processes, because sometimes it is very important to limit the number of threads. So let's take an example, which we have created ourselves, the web server simulation. And let's actually take a look at the, the diagram first. If you remember, we have a request queue here, and then we have a monitor that monitors request queue. And in turn, it generates different threads to process the request in the queue. So let me move this outside. So this is a processor, which is actually processor thread that is generated by monitor. And there can be multiple of them, depending on how many requests are in the queue at the current moment. Let's imagine that at one moment, there are thousands of requests that are queued into the web server. And if we are using the current logic here, you can see that this monitor queue task, which is executed by the monitoring thread, is in an infinite loop looking at the request queue. So if we have thousands of requests queued in the request queue, within a very short amount of time, there will be thousands of threads created in order to process the requests. So the request processor threads like this could be created to handle all of the requests in the queue. So all of these requests, all of the thousand requests will be assigned by the monitor threads to be processed. And having thousands of threads running in the application can be too heavy for the server. That's why most of the web servers or database servers, they all have connection pools and they try to limit the number of concurrent connections within connection pool. For example, the default uh, concurrent connections that are allowed for Azure SQL Server database could be, I don't remember the exact number, but it's around 100 by default. So it's not that many. And if we are just using the code that we implemented to generate the process threads like this, then we are going to have too many threads running at the same time. And we don't want to do that. And semaphore is a synchronization technique that can help us to limit the number of concurrent threads or processes because semaphore is like mutex. If you provide a name to it, then it will be system wide. It can be accessed through different processes. Here is the basic syntax of using semaphore. So we're using the semaphore slim class instead of the semaphore class because semaphore slim is lighter than semaphore. So let's learn to use semaphore slim first. First of all, we're going to create a instance of the semaphore object by providing two parameters, the initial count and the maximum count. Usually you want the two numbers to be the same. So this limits the number of concurrent threads or concurrent processes for executing a specific section of your code. Okay, so if I say three, for example, then the maximum number of concurrent threads or process can execute the protected section of code is three. And then we call semaphore.wait. When we say semaphore.wait, we're trying to enter into the protected section. And as you can see, the protected section is right here. This doesn't have to be the critical section. We are just trying to limit the number of concurrent threads that can run this particular session of code. So when we say wait, we're trying to enter into it. If the current count is greater than zero, then we're able to execute this code. Once it finished calling the wait method, the current count will decrease by one, right? decrement by one. And then when everything is finished, we call semaphore.release. So this will increase the count. Okay, so how this works is, for example, if the initial count is three, then if the first thread comes over and say semaphore.wait, 
it will see that the current count is three. So it will be able to enter. But at the same time, it will decrease the current count to two. And then very soon, the second thread comes over and also tries to enter by calling semaphore.wait. Then the current count decreases to one. And when the third thread comes over, it will call semaphore.wait. Then the current count decreases to zero. However, the first thread, second thread, and the third thread, they all enter into the protected section. So they are able to ex execute the code within it. And when the fourth thread comes over, it sees that the current count is zero. Then it will be blocked right here on the semaphore.wait line, waiting for the semaphore to be released by the previous threads. Let's say at this moment, the first thread finished. Then the semaphore is increased. Right? Semaphore.release, this method, increases the current count of the semaphore object. And, and because it increased the current count, the fourth thread, which is still waiting for enter into the protected section, will be able to just enter into the section right away. So that's how it works. Although I put all of these lines in on the same screen, they don't actually have to be on the same screen. They, and actually, they don't even have to be in the same threads. Now, let's take a look at this example where we use the monitor a thread here. I right? see this monitor queue is being called within a new thread. Right? And this thread is responsible to, to always monitor the request queue. And whenever there is a request, it will create a new thread. So in order to limit the number of threads, we can use semaphore slim class. So let's come over here and try to use that. I'm going to say using. We're using the using statement uh, just because we want to make sure that semaphore slim object is always disposed because uh, it internally uses unmanaged resources. So we always want to uh, get it disposed so that we don't have any uh, memory leaking problems. So I'm going to say semaphore slim. And here we can say the initial count is just let's use the same example, let's say three. And then the maximum count is also three. Now, when we have this, what we can do is at the place where we want to generate the thread, right? Just before that, we want to say semaphore.wait. So this allows us to protect the code right after it. Okay? So these code cannot be executed if the semaphore count is zero. Okay, so you can consider semaphore as a global counter. And we're using that counter to protect a session of code that can be executed concurrently. We're using that counter to make sure that only a certain number of concurrent execution of the protected session can exist at the same time. So we use semaphore.wait here to make sure this is protected. And the reason why we need to protect this is just because we don't want to generate too many threads here. All right, so we have the semaphore.wait. Then the question comes is where do we try to release the semaphore? Well, here, once we gain the semaphore, right, the semaphore current count decreases, then we are creating a new thread. And we're doing our processing inside the thread. Once the processing finishes, that's when we want to release the semaphore, right? The purpose of gaining the semaphore is to, to do this processing. Therefore, we release within this the task of the thread. So here we're going to use try and finally, because we always want to release the semaphore. So we're going to say finally, and then we're going to say semaphore.release. I'm missing a curly brace here. OK. so. As you can see that we have the monitor queue method called within a thread, which is the monitoring thread. And the semaphore.wait is called within the monitor.queue. Whereas the semaphore.release is called within a different thread. Therefore, you can conclude that the semaphore.release and semaphore.wait, they don't have to exist in the same thread. So this comparing to mutex or monitor or lock or reader and writer lock, they're different. 
all of the other techniques has something that is called thread affinity. Okay, so if the thread who enters into the section will have to release it. In this case, semaphore, it doesn't implement thread affinity, therefore it can be called from different threads. In this case, exactly that scenario. All right, so with the semaphore.wait and semaphore.release here, and the initial count and maximum count set to three, we're limiting the number of concurrent threads running at the same time. So what we can do here is we can inside here, after the release, we can say console dot right line, and we can say that thread released semaphore previous count is this many. And here we're gonna say thread dot current thread dot manage thread ID. And then here we're gonna get the previous count. So the release method here actually returns the previous count of the semaphore. So we're gonna say prev count equals this, and then we're gonna put this into the curly braces here. All right, if we are running this, then you're gonna see some interesting thing happening. All right, the application is running. And if I just type in, let's say I just type in A and enter. Now it says process input A and thread 12 released the semaphore. The previous count is two. Why the previous count is two instead of three? Well, that's because once thread 12 gained the semaphore, the count of the semaphore became two. And after it released, we're asking to get the previous count. Of course, it's two, right? And if I enter A and A continuously, then you can see that thread number three released, the semaphore previous count is one. And then 13 released the semaphore previous count is two. That's because we continuously enter two letters and there are two elements in the request queue, basically two requests in the request queue. And when the monitor thread, the monitoring thread over here tries to, uh, not this one, over here tries to do the infinite loop, it sees that there are two requests. So it dequeued the first one and create the first worker thread. Then it dequeued the second one, it creates the second worker thread. When that happens, the sum for the weight is called for each one of those threads. Therefore, when the first thread comes, the sum of four count became two and when the second worker thread came, the semaphore, after executing semaphore.wait, the semaphore count became one. Therefore, when they release one by one, it will be saying one and two. So if I enter A, 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 all three different times, then it will show you zero, one, two. Now, what's gonna happen if I enter letter A or any letter four different times? Well, like I mentioned before, the first thread will have to be blocked, waiting for any of the threads to release the semaphore. So let's say I'm gonna enter B, 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 B. It doesn't really matter what you enter. Now you can see that there are two threads finished processing and the previous count is all zero, right? So that means one of the threads released and then the fourth thread immediately entered which means the previous count is zero. Well, this is, this, is, this is the first thread that released, right? So, and then the fourth thread. So this is the fourth thread that immediately entered and the previous count is of course became zero again because after this, the, the count becomes one. And then after this, the previous count becomes zero again. So this is how it works. If we continuously enter uh, many, many lines, you can see many, many previous count. This is basically uh, all of them are being blocked, uh, except that we only allow three different concurrent threads running at the same time. So this is gonna slow down the processing. However, it's going to protect the application from overloading the server. So of course I'm using three just for demonstration purpose for your real world application. You might be considering like 50, 60, 70, 80, for example, or any number that fits your bill. So 
Another thing before I finish this lecture is that, like I mentioned, semaphore can be a cross process. And for a semaphore to a cross process, you have to specify a name. So a named semaphore is、uh, global to the the system, but you cannot use semaphore slim anymore because semaphore slim can be only used for local semaphore within a process, and you have to use the semaphore. So when you use semaphore, you can see there are different signatures. There's initial count, maximum count, and then the third parameter here is the name. If you need to use semaphore. To protect a particular section across different processes, then you need to use the semaphore class instead of semaphore slim class. But if not, then just use semaphore slim. It does the same thing, and it's not as heavy as the semaphore class. All right, let's recover back to use semaphore slim. And、uh, I just remember another thing that I want to emphasize is that here we're using semaphore slim. To limit number of concurrent threads, but we have to remember that when we're doing this, we're not actually protecting the critical section here. In this example, the web server example, we have never used synchronization techniques to protect critical section. In fact, we should protect critical section、okay? because we're using. A regular queue instead of the concurrent queue. We're going to talk about concurrent collections later. Here, because we're using a regular queue, then this D queue and this in queue, where is the in queue here? They become the critical section. So it's best practice to protect them because it's possible that we're in queuing and D queuing. At the same time, because they belong to different threads. Here, the in queue is working within the main thread, whereas the dequeuing is working within separate worker thread. Using a simple lock here would be enough to solve this problem. We can do something like this. However, later we will be talking about concurrent collections. So let's make this work. Decoration is outside, and then the critical set critical section is inside. And then we need to declare the lock from outside, and we can just say object, and be called Q lock equals new object, and then we're gonna lock our same thing here. We're gonna lock our Q lock. All right. That's everything I want to cover in this video. Any questions? Please let me know. If not, I will see you in the next one.